right. Well, good morning. How you guys doing? You don't have to be depressed. I know about Tennessee. Don't be depressed. They'll, they'll, they'll do better next week. They'll do better. Hey, I am honored to be here. If you don't know me, uh, I am uh, one of the leaders for uh, CUPS Mission, which is an organization that uh, serves folks in the Dominican Republic, uh, Mexico, and Malawi. And uh, just to uh, echo what was prayed, I am grateful uh, for this church who believes in sending out people to the uttermost parts of the world to hear about Jesus Christ. And this church is known for that. I had the privilege to serve here uh, many years ago. I was driving over this morning thinking it was just a few years ago. And then I started doing the math. No, it was about 15 plus years ago. Uh, some of us a little older. You guys aren't older. You still look exactly as great as you did 15 years ago. But I'm a little older and hopefully a little wiser uh, but I am grateful for this church and uh, its reputation, and we've been led in worship this morning, so grateful for that. Uh, you're got, you guys have sent a team where we are serving in the Dominican. Uh, I got to serve with uh, Jackson just a few weekends ago as we launched a project outside Mexico City, so, uh, so I, am, I am extremely grateful for your pastor, uh, Pastor Dave and his family in this church, all the team, the staff. Uh, you, you may not know that you are blessed. Uh, I had the privilege, uh, as if I needed something else added to my plate, for the last five and a half years outside of uh, where I live, a little suburb of Greenville called Greer, South Carolina. Uh, the locals call it Greer, South Carolina. Uh, I had the privilege to serve there uh, on staff as the lead pastor in addition to everything else going on in my life. And so for the first time ever, uh, my wife finds, we find ourselves looking for a church. Now, I'm not recommending that you go visit around, because Dave will come after me if I said that. But I would just uh, suggest to you that if you were to have to go looking for a church, it is easy to find churches. It is more difficult to find churches that are growing and alive and seeking after the things of God. And you're a part of one of those, so I hope that you recognize how blessed you are. When I told people that I was coming up toward uh, this area today, some people said, are you going to Kentucky? I said, no, I'm going to Tennessee. If you pull out a map, they're close to each other, but I'm not going to Kentucky. And as I was driving up this morning, I thought about the last time I did drive to Kentucky. It was to go to see uh, this thing called the Ark. Anybody gone to see the Ark? Okay, a couple of you have been to see the Ark. Uh, I went to see the Ark actually about the time I was here at Buffett leading on the worship team about 15 years ago. My son was about eight or nine years of age, and uh, we had decided, my wife and I, my daughter was off somewhere, we decided we were going to go to the Ark. And uh, we also were going to do the ropes course. They have a ropes course at the Ark. Now, for those of you who are parents or grandparents, you know that sometimes you give your kids or your grandkids instructions. Sometimes they listen. Sometimes they don't, right? That's just the nature of the beast. So I told my son uh, on the way up, I said, we're going to do the ropes course. So you need to bring tennis shoes. Now, those of you who were here at Buffett's 15 years or so ago know because many weekends when I was here uh, leading in the worship team, my son would come with me. And some of you may remember, the only thing he usually wears on his feet are flip-flops. His nickname, as a matter of fact, is Flops. It can be snowing in South Carolina, which is rare, or 115 degrees. He is going to wear flip-flops everywhere he goes. So we get to Kentucky, we're checking in the hotel, and I said to him, son, do you have tennis shoes? No, 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 dad, no, dad, no, dad. It's like, all right, you cannot do the ropes course at the Ark with, with, without tennis shoes, so we're going to have to go to Wally World, we're going to get tennis shoes. We go, we get tennis shoes, the next morning we go over, we go to the Ark, we pull into the parking lot. If you've been there before, then you know... When you pull into the parking lot, you have to get on a bus. And that bus will take you about one mile 
drive to the entrance of the park. You can't pull right up to the entrance. You park in the parking lot, you get on the bus. So we get our belongings, we go to the bus, we get on the bus, we take off toward the entrance. And I look down at his feet as we're sitting on this bus. And some of you are ahead of me, parents, you already know. He has on flip-flops. I said to him, son, where are your shoes? Oh, dad, they're in the car, they're in the car, they're in the car. About the time we pull in to the uh, entrance of the park, I said to my wife, Lynette, I said, I'll go back to the car. I'll get his shoes. You guys wait here. They step off the bus. They're standing there. I get back, just me and the bus driver. We go back on this journey. I get about halfway back to the parking lot, and I start doing this number. And I realize I don't have the keys. So I'm like, okay, it looks like I'm going back for another bus ride. So I stay on the bus. I go back to the entrance. I'm texting her saying I'm coming back for the keys. She's texting me with little emojis, emoticons, smiley faces. I was not smiling. I get back to the entrance. She's standing there with the keys. I say, thank you very much. Give the keys. I'll be back. I go back again. I don't know what trip number this is. If you're counting, help me out. I have no idea. I've lost count. I'm going back. I'm going back. First name basis now with the bus driver. I get back to the parking lot. I go to the car, pop the trunk. There's his backpack. I'm like, here they are. I grab the backpack. I get back on the bus. I start back to the entrance of the park. Something tells me. Some of you guys know your parents. I see it already. Something tells me, unzip the backpack. I unzip the backpack. I'm ru- No tennis shoes. Once again, I'm picking up my phone. The emoticons, emojis, they are flying. Bing, bing, bing. I said, where are the shoes? My wife says, they're in the back seat. They're not in the backpack. Meanwhile, here I am with this backpack, with the crew. I turn around. I wave at her through the window of the bus as it drops people off. And we turn around and I go back again. I don't know what number this is. This is like number six, seven. I don't know. I'm going back. Just me and the bus driver with the backpack. Well, I'm frustrated. I'm not having a good day. So I start praying, right? That's what you do when you're having a bad day. You start praying. So I start praying, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. What can I do? He he impresses me. Look and enjoy the scenery. Look out the beautiful window of the bus and enjoy the beautiful Kentucky grasslands and all the beautiful. Just look. So I look out there and I'm watching. And if you've been to the ark before, you know this. There's this service road that kind of runs parallel to the bus route over in the distance. And I look over in the distance and I see this car. And it starts to move at a high rate of speed, almost as the bus is kind of coming back toward the parking lot. It's moving at a high rate of speed. I look over, and I'm like, wow, what is going on over there? They must be, like, getting ready to chase somebody or something. As I look closer at the vehicle, I notice there's this emblem on the door, on the side of the vehicle. And I'm kind of trying to get my eyes. My eyes aren't that great anymore. I'm trying to look, what is, what is that emblem on the side of the car. I look and it's like a star or something. And then I finally make out almost as the car is back to where the bus is. It says Kentucky State Trooper. I'm like what's going on? What's going on here? As the car gets closer and the bus gets closer. The police car slides sideways like the Duke boys. Slides in two Highway patrolmen jump out. About that time, I'm off the bus and I'm walking to the parking lot to go find these missing shoes as I'm walking. Toward the parking lot, I notice that these two highway patrolmen are walking behind me. They're not walking, actually. They're running. And then I'm finally like, what are they doing? What are they? As I get closer to the car, I finally realize when I hear these words, spread them. And I am up against the trunk of the car wondering what is going on. Now, if you've been following the story, you will remember I was on this bus several times, me and the bus driver, with a backpack by myself post 9-11. So I'm sure the bus driver is radioing his friends going, there is some loser guy riding the bus with a backpack by himself. Finally, it all hits me. All these images hit me, and I start chuckling, realizing what is going on here as I have spread against, spread eagle against the back of the car. I start laughing. The, sher- the uh, highway patrolman, about to say sheriff deputy, the highway patrolman, they are not amused. They're like, sir, you don't need to laugh. You need to drop the bag. By this time, I've dropped the bag. They're going through the bag. They're shaking out the contents. They're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? So I start to explain to them my journey so far. And they start laughing at me. (laughs) They're like, oh, we knew there had to be a reasonable explanation. 
I finally get the shoes. I do get back on the bus. I get back into the parking lot. I, I don't kill my son. He's still alive. He's 23 now. He's survived that far. Give him his shoes all day long as we're walking through the park. The uh, highway patrolmen that were serving that day and the security people are all kind of pushing their earpiece in going, <laughs> you know, they're talking, he's, yeah, he's over here, he's over here. And they're laughing and pointing at me like, you finally made it, you know, finally made it. I tell you that story because I want you to know I, that was not my expectation for the day. I was not expecting to be spread eagle against a highway patrol car. Here's my fear for you and I in the Western culture in which we live. We, our expectations for the Lord Jesus are nowhere near high enough. We have lowered our expectations of what we expect God to do. Now, that circumstance for me was not an enjoyable one until after. I can laugh about it now. I wasn't laughing that day. But that's not what I expected. And I believe that God has for you and I, based on what his word says to us, far beyond what we can imagine or think he wants to do for you and me. He wants to do for his church. He wants to do for your family. He wants to do for the people out there who don't know about the love of God yet. They don't know how marvelous, oh how wonderful is the Savior's love for me because they don't know Him yet. And so I want to encourage you today as we look at the scripture that's already been read, if you've got your Bible, Matthew chapter 9, as we look at these verses, I want to encourage you to change whatever expectation you have for the Lord. I would just suggest to you whatever it is that you can conjure up in your mind's eye as being incredible and phenomenal, it probably does not meet the expectation of God because He is all-powerful, He is all-knowing, He is omniscient, He is the Creator, He is the Holy One. He can do above and beyond what you and I can ask or think because He's God. He spoke and the world came into existence. Now, I'll confess to you, there are many times in my life where I go before God and I pray, and I don't pray thinking about, at the same time, this is the person I'm praying to who spoke the world into existence. Sometimes I approach Him as if I'm an inconvenience. You and I are not an inconvenience for God. He's a good, good Father. He loves you. And we're not an inconvenience for him. Sometimes I approach God thinking, well, maybe you can accomplish this, God, and maybe not. But he's huge. And Jesus, in this passage, has the opportunity as he's going out into the villages and the towns to get people's attention. There's some key things that are happening. And this morning, I just want to point out a few words. I'm not a Bible scholar I'm really not much of a preacher, teacher, pastor. I just, as I read, because of the wonderful spiritual gift of ADD. Has anybody else got that? Yes, I do. As I read, I start to ask questions. And as I ask those questions, it's usually where God answers those questions, where I learn. So as we're reading this text again this morning, I just want to point out some words that pop out to me. And hopefully this will encourage you and I today. So let's read it again. Matthew 9, starting with verse 35. Jesus was going about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Now let me just start, stop right there for just a second. I tend to read and stop when I see certain things. And here's the first word that I see. He was proclaiming the gospel. What is the gospel? You and I know the gospel. The gospel literally means good news. Good news. And what I have discovered in my own life, sometimes the reason my expectations are not where they should be is because due to culture and due to just the, the weight of living in the world and due to media and social media and the influences that we have kind of changing our mindset and our hearts sometimes, I don't always, unfortunately, true confession, I don't always remember that the good news is good news. 
We've sung about it this morning. Jesus Christ took the penalty of sin for me on the cross, paid my debt that I owed, that he didn't know, but he carried my debt, paid that on the cross because of the blood of Jesus, and rose from the dead that you and I might live. That is good news. And I just want to encourage you, people outside these walls need to know that. The media and our culture tries to get shh. They try to get us to be quiet and not talk about the good news. But people are still being changed and transformed by the good news of Jesus. Do you believe that this morning? It's happening. It's happening especially among young people and among college students. If you get off the mainstream media and off social media and you dig in, you will find out that across the United States of America, there are pockets of people where there are 10, 20, 30,000 college-age students where revival is breaking out in cities all over America. You won't see that on your most popular newscasts. But it's happening. Why? Because the good news still transforms lives. But here's what's interesting. It says Jesus was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. The kingdom. What in the world does that mean? The good news of the kingdom. It simply means this. He's proclaiming the good news, which is about his kingdom being ushered in. Jesus was not proclaiming the good news, as great as this is. He was not proclaiming the good news of the church. He was not proclaiming the good news of a denomination. He was not proclaiming the good news of a movement. He was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Now you say, Jack, why is this important? It's important because in our Western culture, and by the way, this highly exists in our culture and doesn't exist so much in other cultures like Guatemala or Honduras or Dominican Republic or Mexico or you name it. It's kind of a Western culture thing where we put our emphasis on the church. And the church is great, and the church is ordained by God, and the gates of hell, the Bible says, will not prevail against the church. But the church, don't, don't throw me out for heresy, check your Bible to make sure I'm right. The church is not the end game. Say, Pastor Jack, what is the end game? The end game is the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God. So is the church important? Absolutely the church is important. The body of Christ, not the building. The body of Christ where we grow, where we encourage each other, where we help each other, where we confess sin to one another, we pray with one another. As, as close and as strong as the church is, to that same degree will be the strength of impact in the kingdom of God. When I was taking church planting, a strategy training, when my wife and I planted a church for about three years, uh, before, before even being here with you guys at Buffett for that time, the trainer used this analogy, and I thought it was very good because it helped me think about it. If you're out on a boat, and maybe some of you who are watching this after today's service that were out on the boat this weekend, we forgive you, we forgive you. Come back to church Sunday. If you are out on a boat on the lake, which is great to do, you point the front of your boat Toward the kingdom of God. In other words, that's your focus. That's where you're headed. That's where all your energy is on the kingdom of God. But what is created in the wake of that boat where people like to water ski and slalom and all that churning water in the back. What's created, that is the church. In other words, what Jesus is going around teaching is, hey, if you will be focused on the kingdom of God, guess what will happen? The church will automatically grow because people's lives will be transformed and they will want to hunger with one another and grow with one another. It's amazing. And by the way, that's what separates some churches in this area from Buffett Heights. It's what separates some churches in Greenville, South Carolina, where I'm at, from other churches. There are a lot of churches but some of them, not Buffett Heights, obviously, because you guys are outward focused with missions and locally and, and around the world. But what happens with a lot of churches is we become so internally focused on our church that we forget about the kingdom of God. He's getting ready to tell us that the kingdom of God is the most important thing. 
Oh, that we could get focused on that again. Because if we were, it would usher in and hasten in the Lord's return. Because more and more people would be transformed by the Spirit of God if that's what our focus was. And so Jesus, we, we pass over. I pass over sometimes some of these words in the Bible. I just skim right over them and don't understand the depth of what Jesus is saying and what he's teaching. And so he's going out proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. He's healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And then it says this. I love this verse 36. Seeing the multitudes. There's another word there. Let me just stop. It's a three letter word. But it's got I-N-G. See. S-E-E. I had a friend of mine tell me just a few weeks ago. We were having this discussion. About this passage. And he said, have you ever heard somebody say to you, be the hands and feet of Jesus? And I said, of, of course, of course. How many of you have heard that before? But just go be the hands and feet of Jesus. Be the hands and feet of Jesus. Here's what he said to me. You and I will never be the hands and feet of Jesus until we have the eyes of Jesus. Until we see people as Jesus sees them. Now, I, I'll just be honest with you, that that's, that's difficult sometimes. When you're in Greenville, South Carolina, and you're driving down the most busy street, which is what I live right off of it, the most busy street in our county, called Woodruff Road, and it's bumper to bumper, and people are cutting you off, and they're giving you signs telling you you're number one. I mean, you, it's really, really hard to see them as Jesus does. What you want to do is ram into the side of their car, but that's not what Jesus would do. So it's really hard sometimes to see people as Jesus does. One reason it's hard is because we are so distracted that we don't even see these devices which i love by the way are are so great and and we were we were sold a lie just so that you know we were told these devices were going to help us they were going to save us time to do other things like have community with people and get to know our neighbor and spend more time with our family because we've got apps and technology and what we did was we replaced these things to save us time so that we could spend the time saved to spend something on another, another kind of technology that would save us time, that would save us time. That would, and now all we do, we have no buffer in our lives for God to show up and do anything. And I'm preaching to me this morning. If your calendar is so busy that you don't have time to sit down with somebody and have a cup of coffee and tell them about Jesus, can I just suggest you're too busy? Because Jesus, one of the great things about Jesus, you can check out this film online, just Google it. It's called um, Godspeed. G-O-D-S-P-E-E-D. -E -E Godspeed. Just Google it. It's a great film that talks about that the reason Jesus was able to impact so many people is because he walked everywhere he went and he moved at Godspeed which was about four miles an hour is what the average person walks, four miles an hour. And you and I, because of technology, devices, and automobiles, and jet planes, and everything else, we're moving at the speed of sound and the speed of light, and we wonder why we don't have opportunity to tell people about Jesus. Slow down. My wife tells me all the time, slow down, slow down. See people for who they are, Jesus saw the multitudes. And what happens when you see people? Here's what happens. You will feel compassion. Compassion. Now, we're in a perfect time right now in, in our history. During this week of the year, after a major hurricane, we were without power for three days in Greenville, South Carolina. I'm still trying to figure out the science of this hurricane. Did it like leap over Florida? Because I talked to my friends in, from Tallahassee all the way around the corner to Tampa. And they're like, no, man, we had a little rain. I'm watching football. I'm like, what the heck? How are you watching football? I don't have any power. I'm in the dark. So I don't know what happened. But I know my sister who lives in Asheville, North Carolina, was greatly affected by the hurricane. Whole towns wiped out. If you're familiar with Chimney Rock, North Carolina, the whole town's gone. And we see that happen, and we can see those pictures on social media, or we can see them on the news, and we can feel compassion, we can feel empathy and sympathy, and we can think that that is compassion. I just want to encourage you, that's not biblical compassion. Say, so what is biblical compassion? 
Biblical compassion is seeing the needs of people and being so moved in your gut that you have to, you're compelled to move to action to do something. That's compassion. And that's the heartbeat of this church or you guys would not be trying to to gather disaster relief items to distribute. So it's so easy to look sometimes at the world and look at what people are going through. Look at fallen relationships, marriages imploding, children that are going off the wayward side, people financially, their, their, their homes or their business are collapsing. And it's easy to look at that and go, oh, I'm so sorry that that's happening and I'll pray for you. And prayer is an important thing. But it's a whole different level to say, I see you, I feel sorry for you, and I'm so moved I'm going to step out into action and do something for you. And Jesus was the master person to do this. As a matter of fact, we just read a couple verses earlier. That's why he was out healing the sick and touching people. He was not just, oh, I'm so sorry that you're a leper. I'm so sorry you're blind. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, he was moved to respond. And he did that. That's that power of compassion. Why in the world did Jesus have compassion? The scripture tells us, verse 36, because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. I love those words. Some translations say this, they were helpless and harassed. Those are good words too. Distressed, downcast, helpless, harassed. Can I ask us a question this morning? Have you taken a moment in the last week, not even thinking about hurricane victims, but have you taken a moment in the last week with your spiritual eyes just to look at what's happening in our culture? Man, if those words don't describe what people, are, what people look like in our culture right now, distressed, helpless, harassed, Like sheep without a shepherd. Folks, we have the blind literally leading the blind. Everything from the top echelons of our nation all the way down. It's the blind leading. They don't have a clue what they're doing and what's going on. And that's what happens when you have sheep roaming around without a shepherd. Man, what a picture that Matthew gives us here of what Jesus is seeing but instead of him, instead of Jesus complaining or tweeting about it or posting on Instagram about it or whatever, Jesus does something different. Jesus says, I'm going to take action. And I would just humbly submit to you, church, it is time for you and I as believers in Jesus to take action. Now, I don't know what that looks like for you. You and the Lord need to pray about that and say, Lord, what does that look like for me in this culture? But I will just tell you, people are distressed. They're downcast. They're helpless. They're harassed. A few months ago, I was out eating by myself, and I just happened to ask the waitress right before I ate, hey, before I I eat, I'm going to pray. Can I pray for you? You would have thought I was presenting her with a $100,000 tip. She was blown away. Oh my gosh, that you're going to ask that question. And I could tell that she was getting teary-eyed because she was so downcast. And people out there need need the hope of Christ. They need that. And we carry that with us in a world that is helpless and harassed. So Jesus says something to his disciples. They've seen him teaching. They've seen him healing. They've seen him demonstrate compassion. And after all this, he looks at them and he says these words to them. One of the most powerful things I think Jesus could say, not only to his disciples then, but I believe to his disciples today. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. As much as I would love to come up with three points and a poem from those verses, I can't do it. It's just one thing. Where are the workers at? Where are the workers at? Jesus is saying, I need workers. 
And here's what's amazing to me. This, this just, this just, I can't fathom this. The creator of the world, who with his word spoke all things into existence, is asking for you and I to be his workers and to partner with him. Now, he could do it all by himself. He's more than capable. He's more than capable to rescue young boys and girls off the street of the Dominican Republic involved in human trafficking by himself. He's more than capable to do that in Nicaragua, Mexico, Guatemala, and Haiti, in the United States. He is more than capable to do that by himself in any way that he would want. But he chooses to afford you and I the opportunity to partner with him. What? That is mind-boggling to me. He wants me to partner with him. Yeah, he wants you to partner with him. He's not just calling out. This is another North, uh, another Western culture miscon- misconception here. He's not just calling out the professional paid pastoral staff. He's calling out every single person that says they know Jesus. Guess what? You may not realize this when you signed up to receive the gift of grace from God, but you signed up to be a missionary. You're going, I'm not planning on going to Africa anytime soon. Why not? I'm going in August. If you want to go, I'll take you with me. But you don't have to go to Africa. You can go right here in Knoxville. You can go over to Powell. You can go over to any suburb, community, school, wherever you are, your workplace, your neighborhood. People need to know Jesus. And he needs workers. But before you can be a worker, you have to know the Lord of the harvest, Jesus Christ. So maybe you find yourself here this morning and you're going, wow, you know what? I am one of those helpless and harassed people. I, I, I feel like I'm wandering around in the world like a blind person. And some, I, whoever's got my hand, I don't even know who it is leading me around. And I need to know the Savior. I need to know the truth. Here's the truth. You're a sinner. And so am I. The truth is, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the truth. The truth is, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the truth. So if you find yourself here this morning, maybe you're visiting, maybe you've been here for five years, maybe you've been here for 50 years, and you feel helpless and harassed with no direction, no purpose in your life, and you're going, I just need to surrender everything to Jesus. I'm going to invite you in just a moment. We'll have some folks here standing to pray with you and encourage you just to say, before I can be a worker, I need to know the Lord of the harvest. And if that's you, in just a minute, I'm going to give you an opportunity just to come down front and say, that's me. You pray with me. For the vast majority of us in here, we probably know the Lord. I hope you do. And if you do, the Lord is asking you, hey, will you, will you come on my team? Get out of the bleachers. Get onto the field. Play the game of life. Let me use you on my team to reach people in this culture with the message of Jesus. Maybe some of you this morning, God would lay on your heart to do that. It may be as a full-time missionary. It may be in your neighborhood. It may be at your workplace where you're going, you know what? There's been so many opportunities for me to share Jesus, and I've just not been the mouthpiece that I need to be. It may be in your neighborhood. maybe in your home. So maybe this morning that's the response that you need to make is say, Lord, here I am. I know you can do it by yourself, but thank you that you are honored to let me partner with you, and I'm ready to be a worker in your harvest field. Would you pray with me this morning?